It took Longstreet several hours to maneuver his 15,000 troops into position, using routes that would conceal them from Union lookouts on Little Round Top. If successful, they could have seized the strategic yet undefended Round Tops. In the meantime, the Union Third Corps, under Major General Dan Sickles, moved without orders to the high ground along Emmitsburg Road, west of Little Round Top. At the Peach Orchard, Sickles' mile-long line formed a sharp angle, or salient. The Confederate infantry assault did not begin until 4 p.m. Major General John Bell Hood's Confederate division, which comprised Longstreet's right, swept out of the woods and over the fields against Sickles' artillery and infantry. Colonel P. A. Works, 1st Texas Infantry, appeared behind a stone wall at the lower edge of the field. The Texas marksmen silenced the cannon, which could not be aimed low enough to hit them, then jumped the wall and advanced up the field. When they neared the upper wall, Colonel A. Van Horn Ellis ordered his New Yorkers to up and fire, staggering the Texans. A daring Union counterattack down across the field kept the Southerners at bay, but Ellis was shot dead. Major James Cromwell of the 124th New York rode down through the triangular field amidst a storm of bullets to rally his men. So gallant did he appear that even some of the Texans shouted, don't shoot at him, don't kill him. He and his gray horse fell dead at the bottom of the field. Shouting, give him hell boys, Brigadier General Henry L. Benning led his Georgia Brigade up through the field in support of the Texans. The hard-pressed Union defenders could not hold, and Devil's Den fell to the Confederates. Colonel Strong Vincent and his 1,300-man Union Infantry Brigade rushed to defend Little Round Top around 4 p.m. on July 2nd. Just as his men took position on the slopes, Texans and Alabamans of Major General John Bell Hood's division began streaming out of the woods. Rapid, deadly fire from Vincent's line drove them back. Hood's determined men rallied and renewed the fight. 358 men of the 20th Maine found themselves anchored at the southern end of the Union line. If they could not stop the Confederate tide on the southern slopes of Little Round Top, the Federal line might be unhinged. For more than an hour, waves of Alabamians repeatedly stormed the hillside, but were repulsed each time. So deadly was the struggle that blood stood in puddles on the rocks. When the New Englanders' ammunition was nearly spent, Colonel Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain ordered a desperate bayonet charge that drove the Alabamians back for good, securing the Union left flank. The 15th Alabama Infantry, commanded by Colonel William C. Oates, lost 343 men and 19 officers, nearly half its strength, in the attempt to dislodge the 20th Maine. His brother John was hit by six bullets and fell mortally wounded. When the Union right flank began to crumble, Colonel Vincent went to their aid. While exposed, he fell mortally wounded. Just when the Federals seemed doomed, over the hill poured the 140th New York Infantry, led by Colonel Patrick O'Rourke. The New Yorkers, who had no time to load their muskets, swept down the hill into the surging Confederates. O'Rourke fell dead when a bullet pierced his neck. After a bloody struggle, the exhausted Southerners fell back, leaving Little Round Top in Union hands. In the summer of 1863, golden wheat grew tall here. But on 4.30 p.m. on July 2nd, the wheat field was transformed into a whirlpool of death. Over a period of two and a half hours, this ground changed hands six times as Confederates of Longstreet's Corps attempted to smash the loosely knit Union line. It was here that the crash came a storm of lead swept through our ranks like hail. Private James Houghton, 4th Michigan Infantry. Colonel Harrison H. Jeffords used his revolver to recapture the colors of the 4th Michigan. 
A moment later, a Confederate thrust a bayonet into his body, mortally wounding him. About 5.30 p.m., following a hot artillery duel, Confederate infantry led by Brigadier General J.B. Kershaw attacked the peach orchard by way of the Rose Farm, but were shredded by rapid rounds of Union canister. Brigadier General William Barksdale's Mississippi Brigade stood in line, impatiently awaiting orders to join the attack. Barksdale was vexed at the delay and repeatedly asked permission to advance. Shortly after 6 p.m., the order came. Barksdale's brigade, followed by Wolford's Georgia brigade, charged the Federals positioned at the Peach Orchard and Surefree Farm and overwhelmed them in a violent struggle. Barksdale rode in front, his white hair gleaming, leading a chorus of rebel yells. The advanced Federal line collapsed as Barksdale drove his Mississippians onward. Near the Trossel Farm, the attack lost its momentum and Union reinforcements drove the Mississippians back. While attempting to rally his men, Barksdale was riddled with bullets. He died that night at a Union field hospital. Mortally wounded, he told a surgeon, tell my wife I am shot, but we fought like hell. When the Union advanced position at the Peach Orchard collapsed around 6.30 p.m., Confederates began to surround the wheat field. The Federals fell back towards Cemetery Ridge, leaving pools of blood along their retreat. Shrieking like Indians, the rebels drove the Union defenders back toward the cemetery ridge. Sickles' salient was crushed. After the collapse of the Union line at the Peach Orchard, Confederate infantry threatened to pour through a gap in the Union line. When Major General Winfield S. Hancock, commander of the Union Second Corps, rode up to assess the situation. Only one regiment was at hand to stop the Confederate tide, the 1st Minnesota. My God, are these all the men we have here? Hancock asked. Charge those lines, and immediately the lone regiment swept down the slope at the double quick. With leveled bayonets, the Minnesotans crashed into Brigadier General Cadmus M. Wilcox's Alabamians, who outnumbered them four to one. The charge broke the Confederate ranks and stalled the Southerners long enough for the Union reinforcements to arrive. The Union line was saved, but at a terrific cost. According to a regimental officer, of the 262 Minnesotans in the charge, only 47 escaped death or injury.